Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle. I'm the VP of Events at Carlton AI Society. And today's lecture is uh, clustering. And I'm here with Abdullah, who is the presenter for this lecture. So I'll pass it off to him to get started. All right. So hi, everyone. Today is actually our second lecture for this term. The title is clustering. And before we start, I'm just going to go over some things. I'd like to remind you that we have our own CISX competition and the deadline, I believe, is in a week. So you still have plenty of time to join, to participate. And for more info on the competition in general, you can check carltonai.com x. Uh, also this Sunday, there is our third lecture and final lecture for this term on dimensional reduction. Basically Sunday, 6 p.m. And we're going to discuss two famous algorithms, principal component analysis and linear discriminant analysis also known as Fisher Discriminant Analysis. Uh, and I'd like to thank our sponsor, CPA Ontario. All right, so today actually, we're gonna start by defining what is clustering. We're gonna talk a bit about unsupervised learning. And then from then we can go, we're gonna discuss probably the most famous clustering algorithm there is, which is K-means. And after that, we're gonna actually discuss what, something called Gaussian mixture models, which can be thought of as a generalization of K-means but also it's, it's, it has lots of other uses and uh, it, it's, it's much stronger than just being a general version of k-means. And then we're going to introduce an algorithm called expectation maximization, which is an algorithm which we can use to estimate the parameters of GMNs. Before we start, I'd like to remind everyone that in the previous talk we had, we discussed something called maximum likelihood estimation. And maximum likelihood estimation is basically if we have data, and we assume that the data follows some, some given distribution, we can estimate the parameters of the distribution that would maximize the likelihood of observing that data. And we can do that, and we did that actually for some discrete and some continuous distributions. And basically the goal is the following, as you can see in equation one, where we have data D and we would like to find parameter theta that would maximize the probability of observing the data D given those parameters. And we do that actually by assuming the data is IID and then we take the log of the likelihood and then we can take derivatives equated to zero and so on. So in today we're going to discuss clustering and clustering falls under something called unsupervised learning. So in, in machine learning, there are basically three kinds of problems. There is supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement learning. And in the case of supervised versus unsupervised, the main difference is the existence of ground truth labels, which means if we have a set of images, we do know what each image contains. If we have a text, we know the translation and so on. So in the case of unsupervised learning, those ground truth labels are not available. They are missing. So what we can do with the data is different than what we can do in supervised learning. So in unsupervised learning, we can actually do something called clustering which is we divide the data into groups or clusters such that the items in each cluster are more similar to each other than they are to items from the other clusters. And the goal is, the goal of clustering is we can do multiple things. We can actually use clustering to find intrinsic hidden, intrinsic hidden structure in the data. We can use clustering to represent high dimensional data in low dimensional space. And clustering is actually very popular. We can use it for so many applications like you can think of if you have some customers right and you have their purchase histories you can group customers based on their purchase histories to find patterns to find trends you can actually apply it to facebook user data for example group users based on their interests based on their behavior patterns on on the on facebook platform and so on so the goal of clustering is to find a clustering assignment which means we would like to assign each data sample to a cluster such that we have high intra-cluster similarity and high inter-cluster dissimilarity. What that means is we would like the samples that we put in the same cluster to be very similar to each other. And we would like them to be very different from the samples that we choose to place in other clusters. So the first question that pops up is how do you measure similarity between samples? And we can do that actually in so many different ways, right? We can use any distance metric, and it doesn't have to be a distance metric, to measure similarity between a pair of samples, such as Euclidean distance, cosine, L1, L2, and so on. And then this next question would be, well, how can we evaluate 
the partitioning of a set of data points into clusters? And the answer is by defining an objective function that measures how good is this clustering assignment. And the first thing that we have to get out of the way is that the exhaustive solution is not feasible. It's NP hard. And what I mean by exhaustive solution is if you think that we have N data points and we have K clusters, basically trying every possible assignment for these points to all the clusters and then measuring the corresponding value for the objective function and choosing the best, that just that's not feasible. So we have to find better ways. And this is just a diagram to show the goal of clustering is to have these samples to be close to each other when they are within one cluster and to be as far away from possible from points that belong to different clusters. So we start with k-means algorithm. So k-means algorithm uses the Euclidean distance to measure the similarity or dissimilarity between a pair of points. And the input to k-means is simply a data matrix X, which is which where we have n samples and each sample has f dimensional features. And we do assume that the samples are independent and identically distributed. And it also takes as input k, which is the number of clusters which we, we aim to divide the points into. So, and the output of k means is going to be the set of clusters v1, v2, all the way to, to vk, such that the joining, if we join all these sets, all these clusters, they cover all of the data and they have no overlap. So if you choose any two different clusters, their overlap is zero or as two sets, it's an empty set. The objective function that k-means tries to minimize is this one right here. And let's, let's take a deeper look to see what it means. So basically what we do is we are aiming to learn two things, mu and z, where mu is basically the cluster centers and Z is the assignment matrix, which where we assign every data point to a given cluster. So what we would like is, is the sum over all the data points and all the clusters to be minimized such that. So what does this mean? This is the distance between point XM or sample XM and the center of cluster K, right? So this is the L2 distance. This is the Euclidean distance between a given sample and a given cluster center. And this Z and K is actually the assignment matrix or the assignment value. And it actually means, does sample N belong to cluster K or not? So this actually takes a zero or one value in this case. So if Z and K equals one, then we have assigned point XN to cluster K. If it is equal to zero, it means we did not assign sample XN to cluster K. So as you can see here, the assignment matrix Z takes binary values, zero or one, and it only takes one if that point has been assigned to that cluster. And matrix mu is actually, here we have K clusters and each one of them is size F because it's the same dimensionality as the data we have. And they represent the cluster centers. So, at first I'll introduce how the algorithm works and then we're gonna go into detail and explain each part of it. So the way that K-means algorithm actually works is, we start with some random, let's say random initial cluster centers, and then we iterate. Now we have some cluster centers. So what we do is we measure the distance between each sample and all these cluster centers, and we assign value one to the cluster that is closest to the cluster center that's closest to that point, which means if we have sample N, we measure its distance to all mu one, mu two, all the way to mu K, and we find the smallest one, and then we assign Z and K value one for that closest cluster center and zero otherwise. After we have done that, we have just calculated matrix Z, right? What we do is we update our cluster centers based on the new assignment, which is, it, this looks a lot like the average, right? Basically, you take all the samples that actually belong to the cluster and you add them up, and then you divide by the size of the cluster. Right. So the k-means algorithm actually terminates when the assignments do not change anymore and the cluster centers do not change anymore, which means Z and mu basically, they don't change. We cannot update them. It doesn't matter if we update them or not. And uh, k-means is actually guaranteed to converge to a local optimum, right, at each step that will decrease the cost function or improve the objective function. 
However, um, <clears throat> sorry, convergence to a global optimum is not guaranteed. So let's take a, an example here and actually see what how it works. So we have these data samples in green. And in this case, we have two clusters. So what we do is we start by some random. <clears throat> we have some random cluster centers, the blue X and the red X. They represent the initial cluster centers. Now what we do, the first thing that we do is we calculate the assignment, right? So we basically every point we measure its distance to the blue X and the red X, which represent cluster centers, and we assign it to the cluster that it's closest to. So in that case, all the points to the left of this pink line will belong to the cluster, the blue cluster, and all the one points to its right will be assigned to the red cluster. After we have calculated the assignment, we can update our cluster centers by simply taking the average of all the points that were assigned to that cluster. So the new cluster centers, as you can see, is this blue, the blue X now is here and the red X. And now we repeat the same process. So based on the new cluster centers, we calculate assignment matrices again, right? And using the same method, we measure the distance of every point to, cluster, to all cluster centers and we assign it to the closest cluster center. After that, we update the cluster centers again and we keep repeating this process. And as you can see in the end, we have somewhat well separated clusters, right? All the points here are very close to each other and they're far away from the points that of that cluster and so on. Right? But k-means can actually be used for something besides clustering. It can be used for data compression, right? Or what we call vector quantization. So it's used as follows. Let's say we have an image in RGB space where each pixel is actually 24 bits. Right? What we can do is if you want to compress the data such that instead of having 24 bits for each pixel, if you would like to have three bits per, for each pixel, we can do the following. We can take the values that these pixels take, right? We have, doesn't matter what's the size of the image, we take all the pixels in the image and we cluster them using k-means based on their actual values, right? Based on their RGB values. As a result, we get something like this. So all here, the pixels that are somewhere in yellow will be here and so on, right? Based on their color. After that, we represent each pixel now with its cluster center that it was assigned to. So basically, if you want to go from 24 bits per pixel to three bits per pixel, we can actually cluster the data such that we have eight different clusters. And based on these clusters, we can re like reconstruct the image and it will use significantly less space while the resolution is minimally distorted, you can say. And of course, if the resolution, if you don't like it, you can increase the number of clusters and as a result, you get a better image, right? So if you want, instead of having to represent each pixel with three bits, you can represent it with five. And in that case, you apply k-means where the number of clusters is 32. And this is another example of the same thing. So if we have an, an original image, simply if we do clustering with where the number of clusters is two, you can clearly see that we only have two colors. And as you increase the number of clusters, the quality of the image increases. So depending on the goal, depending on the application, you can find a proper value of K in based on each case that we're interested in. So let's look at some, um, let's look at an, um, a probabilistic interpretation of k-means. k-means basically always learns or clusters the data into spherical clusters, spherically shaped clusters. So basically each cluster will actually correspond to a Gaussian distribution where the covariance matrix is identity and the mean of that distribution is mu k. All right, so as we discussed in our last lecture, Every Gaussian distribution can, can be parameterized using a covariance matrix sigma and the mean vector mu. In the case of k-means, we assume that the covariance matrix is identity. What that means is each two different features in the data are actually independent, right? There is no covariance between them. The covariance is zero and the variance of each feature is basically one. And then we assign samples to a cluster where the likelihood of drawing that sample from the Gaussian distribution 
corresponding to that cluster is maximized, right? So another way to formulate the same objective function is saying, I would like, what is the probability that I get sample Xn given the clustering assignment matrix and the cluster centroids or centers, right? Well, you can multiply from K equals one till K the probability of sampling point Xn from the Kth Gaussian distribution and we raise that to power z of nk. And because we know z and k actually takes binary values, so for all the clusters that point xn was not assigned to, this power will be zero. As a result, these terms will be one. So the only term that will contribute to this, to this likelihood is actually going to be the cluster that the point was assigned to, where z, z and k was basically one. Right? So this is for a single point. So we can apply the same thing we applied in the case of uh, MLE or maximum likelihood estimate, which is we assume the data samples are IID, independent and identically distributed. And basically we can multiply. So the probability of observing the whole data is simply the multiplication of observing each point. And then we can take the log likelihood. And because of the properties of the log, these two multiplication terms will turn into summation. And this power here, will basically drop down, right? And when we take the log of the of the Gaussian distribution, we're basically gonna boil it's gonna boil down to something that looks like this, right? And this was our original objective function, which means the same thing. But you can see the link now between the objective functions of a function of k-means and maximum likelihood estimate where we assume the data is comes from Gaussian distributions. Right? However, there are some issues in k-means that we have to discuss. The first one is k, which is the number of clusters, because in the case of k-means, we do have to predetermine the number of clusters before running the algorithm. And depending on that value, the performance of the clustering algorithm will vary greatly, right? So how do we choose k? And the obvious, the obvious edge cases are, well, we have one cluster, which means put all the points together. And that's not really useful because we're not uncovering any hidden structure. We don't gain anything, right? Or, well, put each point in a cluster on its own. And again, that's not really useful because it doesn't give us any insight into the data. But it's very clear that if we assign each point to its cluster, we get actually the best objective function, right? Because it's absolutely minimal. In each cluster, there is one point. Its distance to itself is zero. And its distance to other points is as large as possible. So the cost will decrease as we increase the value of K, but we aim to find a proper value of K, right? And one way to approach that is to actually use something called the elbow method, which is we find the value K, which corresponds to the highest relative drop in the cost function or the objective function, right? So if you look at this data here and you're trying to determine how into how many clusters should I divide this data, well, there is no clear notion, right? You could divide it into six different clusters. You could divide it into two. You could divide it into four. So one, the simplest approach to determine the number of clusters is to simply, well, try a few values of K and then do this plot, which is this is the value of K, right? I think this is this, the label is wrong, but basically we, we try different values of K and we look at the corresponding objective function. So after we do the clustering, how good was this labeling assignment? So what we aim to find, we aim to find this point, right? Because as you can see, we have one cluster, we have a very bad value for the objective function, we turn it into two, and the, the, object, the assignment is actually better, and we keep improving it until we get k equals four. And you can see that if we go from k four to five or six, the improvement in the objective function is very minimal. So we choose k to be equal to four. So the other issue we have to deal with is that initializing the cluster centroids or the cluster centers, because we, we said that K means is guaranteed to converge to a local minima, but that's not a global minima. And the quality of the local minima will depend also greatly, not just on the value of K, but also on the initialization of the cluster centroids. Because in certain edge cases, your k-means algorithm can obtain one or multiple empty clusters, and that's very not desirable. So how do we initialize the cluster centroids? Well, the simplest approach is, well, random initialization. 
but run the algorithm multiple times and choose the run that gives you the best results. Another approach is to say, I'm going to pick the cluster centers to be as far away from, from each other as possible. However, the problem with that is this initialization is very sensitive to outliers because if all of your data is very close to each other, but you have a few outliers here and there, your cluster centroids, their initial values will be very close to those outliers and you will not end up with good solutions. Well, the most common approach to initialize k-means is called k-means plus plus. And it tries to find a balance with the previous approach. What it does is we pick centers one at a time. And each time we sample the next cluster, its location or its value is actually proportional to its square distance from the centers that we have chosen already. So this sort of protects us from choosing cluster centroids that are very sensitive to outliers, right? But even if we address these two issues, even if we solve the issue with choosing the number of K, choosing the initialization, K means it still has some issues. And the first one is that it's very expensive when we have large values for N, F, or K, which means we have too many clusters, the dimensional space is very high dimensional space, and we have too many samples. And the main limitation is that the clusters are forced to be of spherical shape because they are sampled from a Gaussian distribution with identity covariance, right? And each sample actually only belongs to one cluster. This is called the hard clustering assignment. So as you remember, the assignment matrix Z only took value zero or one. And it's very, it's not very clear how k means can handle categorical data, right? Because how would you measure the distance between categorical samples if all if you're using Euclidean distance? And the other issue is that we really need to determine k in advance before we run the algorithm. It's also sensitive to noisy data, it's sensitive to outliers, and all the items are assigned to some cluster, which means even the outliers we actually assign them to a given cluster. There are other clustering algorithms that don't do that, just as dbscan. Basically, we cluster most of the data, but the outliers, we just say these are outliers and they don't belong anywhere. And k-means tend to actually not give us good results. When we have clusters have different sizes or different densities, or they have non-globular shapes. For example, if this was our original points, this is, this is what they look like. If we, and we knew the ground truth that these belong to three different clusters of these shapes. If we try to cluster this using k-means, what we would end up with is something like this, which is clusters of similar sizes. And if we have actually clusters that have different densities, just like we can see here, right? If this was our ground truth cluster or labels, if we cluster the data using k-means, what we would get would be most probably something like this. And again, it does not take into consideration that different clusters can have different sizes, different densities. And another example is, is if we have certain shapes in the data that's not simply spherical, k would not get good results. For example, if this was our original data and we tried to cluster it with k means, it's not going to give us this is one cluster and this is the other. Basically, going to chop the data in half and say this is one and this is the other, as you can see here. So to address some of the issues with k-means, we introduce a model called Gaussian mixture model, models. And this actually addresses two very limiting assumptions of k-means. The first one is that each point belongs to one cluster and only one cluster. And the other point is that clusters have spherical shapes. So the way that GMM addresses these two limitations is that the first one, clusters don't need to have spherical shapes. They could be elliptical. And the way that it does that, it says the covariance matrix of the Gaussian distributions, which correspond to the clusters, is actually a full covariance matrix. It's not identity. And the other thing is, samples can belong to more than one cluster, which is what we call soft clustering, right? This is sometimes called fractional, fractional assignment, which we interpret as probabilities. So now our Z and K, and instead of taking value zero or one, can actually take any value in the range between 0 and 1, as long as when we add up all the Z and Ks across all the clusters, we end up with value 1, right? So what GMM does is it assumes that the data come from a weighted sum of K 
f-dimensional Gaussian distributions. And the data is actually characterized by three things. The means of these clusters or the means of the Gaussian distributions, their covariance matrices, and the weights of each clusters, right? Because they don't need to all have the same weight, the same contribution. And we call that theta. So when we talk in the context of GMMs that we're trying to learn the parameters of the model, what we are basically trying to learn is theta, which is we're trying to learn the means and covariance matrices of the clusters and their weights, right? So GMM actually represents the data as a mixture of densities or a mixture of basically Gaussian distributions. So the probability of observing sample Xn given the model parameters is simply the summation of X1, the summation across all the clusters of the probability that we get a sample from the Gaussian GK and the probability that since we are a GK, we sample Xn from GK, right? And the probability of GK is simply the weight of that Gaussian distribution, pi k, and the probability of sampling Xn from a Gaussian distribution GK is simply the probability of sampling it from a Gaussian distribution giving mu, given mu and the covariance matrix. Right? So GK is simply the component clusters that we have, which correspond to, Gauss, to Gaussian distributions. And the parameters of the models, like I said, is theta. Right? So what we call probability GK is pi of K, which is the mixer proportions, right? Or the mixing weights. And in here, they also have to take values between zero and one, and they need to add up to one. So they're, they're determining the contribution of each cluster to sampling this point, right? So what is the likelihood estimate for sample Xn? We can also represent it this way saying, to get sample Xn, you basically need to sum over all the clusters and then you assign the point to cluster K, given the parameters, what is the probability that I assign point Xn to cluster K given the parameters? And then after I have assigned it to cluster K, what is the probability that I'm gonna sample point Xn from the Gaussian distribution corresponding to cluster K? And that basically boils down to the same thing, to the same previous equation. And our goal is to find theta that maximizes this log likelihood for data X, right? So if we start from here, this equation, and we basically do the likelihood, this is the likelihood of one sample. If we go to the likelihood of the whole data and we assume data is IID, we're gonna multiply with all of the all of the data samples. So we add multiplication of N equals one to N capital, right? Then if we take the log likelihood, we end up with equation 14, right? Which is the log likelihood of, get, of observing data X given the parameters actually looks as the summation of n equals 1 to n, then the likelihood of summing over all the clusters and then observing each sample. And because we here have a sum, when we add the log likelihood, we add the log, we can't bring it in, right? So as you can see, this is the main difference between k-means and GMM, right? So in here, we have a log with a summation inside and we can't push the log inside. And this makes the problem very difficult. So if I go back to k-means, I'll just show you what it looks like. In the case of k-means, we had here a multiplication across all the clusters, and then we had another multiplication over the data samples. So when we took the log, the log can be pushed all the way inside, and these multiplications turn into summation. However, in the case of GMM, because we actually here have a summation instead of multiplication, when you take the log, you can't push the log inside. And this is why the Gaussian mixture problem is much more difficult to solve than the k-means problem, right? Because we have a logarithm of the sum. So to solve it, which means to estimate the parameters of the Gaussian mixture models, we have to use an algorithm called expectation maximization. And this is actually a very popular tool in statistical estimation problems, where we have either mixture, mixture estimation, which means we have multiple components, and we're not sure which component generated the data, uh, or we have some incomplete data, we have unobserved data, we have latent variables. And the aim is we wanna estimate the model parameters theta for which the observed data is most likely to be sampled, right? So the expectation maximization algorithm 
guarantees that we'll improve the cost function at every step and we will converge to a local optimum, but it does not guarantee the convergence to a global optimum. And it is basically an iterative two-step algorithm, which we will introduce in a, in a few slides, right? So let's start like this. Because it's an iterative algorithm, we need to refer to the model parameters at each step. So the model parameters at iteration T, it's going to be called theta of T, which is the current cluster centers and their covariance matrix at step T and the mixing weights also at step T. So now we denote the posterior at each iteration, which is the probability that point Xn has been assigned to cluster K given the parameters at the current step and given the point is actually going to be, we could call this Q and K at step T, which is, this is the probability of assigning point N to cluster K at step T. So the EM algorithm actually has two steps, the E step and the M step, the expectation and the maximization. In the E step, the missing data is estimated given the observed data and given the current parameters of the models or the current estimation of the model parameters. And in the maximization step, we will maximize, the likelihood function is maximized under the assumption that the missing data are actually known, which is, this is why EM is actually guaranteed to increase the likelihood function, the value of the likelihood function at each iteration. So last slide before we introduce the algorithm is this. So we have the posterior probability, which we mentioned before Q and K, and we are interested in how can we calculate that, right? So this is the probability that sample N belongs to cluster K. So Q and K equals to the posterior sample, posterior probability that we assign sample X N to cluster K, giving the model parameters. But this is just a conditional probability, right? We can actually write it using the definition of, uh, of uh, conditional probability like this, which is the joint probability of assigning sample X N to cluster K and observing sample Xn and parameters having their values divided by the probability, the joint probability of Xn and model parameters theta. After we do that, we can actually marginalize over the model parameters, both in the denominator and the denominator, right? Once we have done that, we can actually simplify this thing by breaking it into two components, right? The first one is we're basically saying this is the probability of assigning the probability that data sample n is assigned to cluster k given the parameters and multiplied with the probability that we observe this point xn given that we assigned it to cluster k and given that we have model parameters theta and the denominator does not change. Right? Once we have done that, right, we can actually now simplify the denominator well, the probability of observing sample Xn given the parameters is simply the summation across all the clusters that we assigned it to each one of them, and then we observed it by sampling from that Gaussian distribution, by getting from that cluster. By it's, it's being observed due to that cluster, right? So now you can see that the probability of Zn equals K is actually pi of K, which is the weight or the mixing weight of cluster K. And the probability of sampling point Xn from cluster K is simply the likelihood that we observe it from the Gaussian distribution corresponding to that cluster. And the denominator is the same thing. This is pi of J, and this is sampling point Xn from the cluster J, right? So now we actually have a closed form solution to how to calculate Q and K. But it's very important to remember now we are assuming that we know pi of k, mu of k, and the covariance matrices. So to calculate the posterior probability, we have to have a value for these three. So what the EM algorithm basically does is we have an update rule at each step, and we know that the posterior probability has to be larger than zero and add up to one because it's a probability, right? So we, the same previous equation, we just add t here to indicate that this is the current estimate of the model parameters. And at each step, they will be changed. And this is our current estimate of the posterior probability. So the EM algorithm first starts 
by assuming some initial value for theta zero, which means we assign all these Gaussian distributions, random clusters, it doesn't have to be random, but we assign them some cluster centroids, we assign them see the mean of the distribution, the covariance of the distribution, and the mixing weight of the distribution. And given those values, we start with the E step. And in the E step, we have two things to do. The first one is we compute the marginal likelihood, which is given these values of mu k, pi k, and sigma k, we simply calculate this, which is the log likelihood of observing the data. And after that, we can actually calculate the assignments, q of n k, because again, we know pi of k, we know mu of k, we know sigma of k, right? So we can calculate q and k at the current step given the parameters. And in the maximization step, now we assume that, okay, given the current estimate of q and k, let's improve our estimate of the mean, of the covariance, and the mixing weights. And we actually solved this part in the last lecture when we said if you're trying to estimate the parameters that maximize the likelihood of a given distribution, you take the, you take the derivative, you equate it to zero. This looks a lot like it, but here we just have here Q of NK. Simply for distribution K to find the mean of that Gaussian distribution, well, you sum all the samples, but you multiply them with their probability of belonging to that cluster and then you divide by the probability of all the points belonging to that cluster. And the same for the covariance matrix. So if you ignore here Q and K, this is the normal way of how we find the covariance matrix for any Gaussian distribution. But we multiply because each point could belong with different probability to that Gaussian distribution. And of course, we have to normalize by the sum of all the probabilities that all the points belong to that cluster. And the mixing weights is simply we sum the posterior probabilities, we sum it all, and then we divide by n. Right. So the expectation maximization algorithm works as follows. As you can see here, we don't start with an initial estimate of just the cluster centers. You see we have cluster centers and we have their covariance matrix. Right? Then we do the first step, which is the expectation, which is given these Gaussian distributions, let's assign the points to their clusters, but this is a soft clustering problem. So you can see we have some points that are blue, which means they belong to the blue Gaussian with probability one. We have the points which are red, but we have some things which are in between, purple, which means these points actually come from both distributions with different probabilities. And then after we did the assignment, which is this is calculating Q and K, right? Now we do the maximization step, which is we update the shapes of our Gaussians, which is we update the mixing weights, we update mu, we update, sig we update sigma, given this assignment. And as you can see, the clusters would look something like this. Then we repeat, given this clustering assignment and given the model parameters, let's update Q and K. Let's calculate the new NK, right? And you can see the assignments change. Then after that, given the new NK, we continue to change and update one step. We assume that the model parameters are fixed and we calculate the posterior probability, which can be interpreted as assigning points to their clusters. And the maximization step, what we do is, we assume that the assignments are fixed and we update the model parameters, right? And, and this looks actually a lot like k-means algorithm because if you look at k-means, the EM algorithm for k-means is very similar, right? Where we choose the initial cluster centers then we assign each sample to its closest centroid and then we adjust the centroids such that we assign each point. I'm sorry. And after that, we adjust the centroids given the new assignment matrix. And we keep repeating these two steps until convergence. Right. So what we did today is we discussed, we gave a very quick overview of what is clustering, what is k-means algorithm, what is Gaussian mixture models. And to actually estimate the parameters of Gaussian mixture models, we got the chance to introduce expectation maximization algorithm. And I know this is a very introductory or basic presentation, but uh, we can actually use these tools for much more interesting topics, let's say. For example, we can actually present Gaussian mixture models in a future lecture as latent variable model, where we have a model where we have hidden variables and we're trying to estimate them.
also the expectation maximization, we didn't really go into its theory. We just said what it looks like, right? Or how it's solved. But we can actually connect expectation maximization, maximization algorithm to the elbow bound, right? Which is related to variational inference and we connect that to variational autoencoders. But that's a topic for another day. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that next week is the deadline for our CIS competition. And if you are interested, please check the details for on our website, cartonai.com slash X. Uh, I'd like to remind you again that next Sunday, we actually have, a, let's say, significantly longer lecture, but it's much more interesting, where we will discuss dimensionality reduction. And in that one, it's going to be like twice as long, but we're going to go into so much details in, in terms of principal component analysis and viewing it from different points. We're going to view it from minimizing covariance. We're going to view it from the solving it using SVD. We're going to look at linear discriminant analysis. We're going to compare the two. It's, it's a very interesting lecture, so if you attend, that would be great. And I would like to thank our sponsor, CPA Ontario. And thank you so much for attendance. Um, if you have any questions, I think we can hop on to, we can go to our Discord and chat there, because this way everybody will get a chance to speak, not just me. So I actually didn't see that there was, ah, oh, there was one question. Oh, okay, this is the past event. So can you hear me, Kyle? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, just, just posted the Discord link. Great. All right, cool. So let's jump is that to this everything? Question. Yeah, that's it for today. All righty. Well, thank you everyone for attending. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out on our socials or our Discord. All right. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.